Hello everybody and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about a specific kind of marriage related to some of these new ideas about love that we talked about last time that developed in Europe but that has since spread all over the world with a variety of consequences. First, let's get our definitions sorted out. We're talking about companionate marriage. According to our authors today, Ward and Hirschlow, companionate marriage is generally defined as a marital ideal in which emotional closeness is understood to be both one of the primary measures of success in marriage and a central practice through which the relationship is constituted and reinforced. So you get married because you love someone. The amount that you love someone is how you know that your marriage is successful. And the more you work at loving each other, the better your marriage is. Both romantic love and confluent love in Giddens' terms could lead to a companionate marriage. We also have this other definition that Hirsch and Wardlow borrow from Laura Kipnis. In the historical literature on love and marriage, most of which has focused on Europe, the term companionate marriage implies a constellation of associated ideals and practices, and some of this should sound familiar from Giddens. Marriage based on a prior romantic relationship, individual choice in spouse, monogamy as opposed to polygamy, sexual fidelity within marriage, nuclear family households, neo-locality, um, the idealization of verbal over instrumental expressions of attachment, like saying I love you instead of giving gifts, preferring the company of one's spouse over familial or same-sex sociality, that ideal that your spouse is supposed to be also your best friend, viewing marital sex as an expression and symbol of emotional attachment, so the more sex you have, the better your marriage is, and viewing marriage as the presumptive venue of emotional gratification, marriage and your relationship with your spouse more than anything else is the thing that's supposed to make you happy and fulfill you in life. So where did companionate marriage come from? It's kind of a mystery. There are a bunch of different suspects or perhaps contributing factors. One of them is European medieval courtly love practices, which ironically were actually about adultery more so than marriage. If you are at all familiar with the stories of King Arthur, um, his wife Guinevere, and Guinevere's lover, the knight Lancelot, then this would be one of the major stories um, about courtly love. Um, Tristan Isolde is also an opera um, and an old, again, um, Cornish French romance. Courtly love is associated with chivalry and the aristocracy centered around a knight's service to his lady. So we don't have monogamy, but we do have this idea of love and devotion and choice. And this developed in the medieval literature of French courts throughout Europe. C.S. Lewis, the fantasy author, referred to courtly love as love of a highly specialized sort whose characteristics may be enumerated as humility, courtesy, adultery, and the religion of love. Again, this should sound familiar, right, when Giddens talks about romance as having a sublime religious quality. If you ever want to read one of these stories, um, the Joseph Bedier translation of Tristan and Assault is on Project Gutenberg Go To. <laughs> it begins with this incredibly dramatic bit. My lords, if you would hear a tale of love and of death, here is that of Tristan and Queen Assault. How to their full joy, but to their sorrow also, they loved each other. And how at last they died of that love together upon one day she by him and he by her. Even though their relationship is adulterous, they nevertheless have this undying devoted love that ties them together 
throughout their lives and that serves as their primary motivation for what it is that they do. All right, so we've talked about courtly love. Let's also talk about particular Christian ideologies of marriage where the relationship between a man and a woman is supposed to mirror the love between Jesus and the church. This is St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, verses 22 to 32 in the King James translation in English. And I've bolded the really important parts. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. If you would prefer this in Russian, Here's the Russian version. Hit pause and read it at your leisure. Okay, so courtly love, Christian ideas of marriage, changing demographics may have also played a role. In the wake of the Industrial Revolution, you see urbanization as labor becomes not spread out but concentrated in factories. And then people move to live near the factories. And then you get all of these cities springing up around the factories. And in an urban environment, you don't need as many children. In fact, more children is harder to deal with. In an agricultural setting, more children is more people to help out. But cities don't work that way. We could also think more about the rise of wage labor changing the meaning of home. And again, this should sound really, really familiar. As labor moves outside the house, home becomes this warm, fuzzy concept that's supposed to revolve around the love of spouses and the love between parents and children. Okay, factors, factors, factors. We can also perhaps point to technological advances. So for example, medical improvements that allowed for longer lifespans, widespread availability of birth control and better, more effective birth control. Um, if you don't know this, birth control is actually really, really old. Condoms made out of sheep intestines are a technology that goes back centuries and centuries. Butchers used to also always make condoms. Um, those are actually pretty effective. Uh, not necessarily at preventing the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases, but at preventing the transfer of sperm. Yeah, they're great. Um, but they still have a failure rate and you also have to actually use the condom, which sometimes people don't wanna do. Um, so as you get things like hormonal birth control or forms of surgical sterilization, um, intrauterine devices, those are super effective. Uh, it's also, again, easier to have fewer children to control when you have those children and to spend more time focused on the marital relationship. Other things that help you focus on the marital relationship at home are things like um, the industrialization of the household, right? Home electronics and appliances. So basically, Washing machines and dishwashers and birth control make it possible for people to live longer and spend less time doing housework and instead just like cuddling on the couch. Okay, so we don't know which of these factors is the primary factor. We do know that we cannot attribute the rise of companionate marriage entirely to changes in material circumstances, but the material circumstances do matter and probably also contribute. All right, so companionate marriage is spreading. This is something that starts and develops in Europe, but Europe is full of colonizers. So um, we have 
old fashioned kinds of colonization. We have missionization and we have neocolonial media that are continuing to spread this idea of companionate marriage. Hirsch and Wardlow note that the companionate ideal has grown in prominence as part of the repertoire of concepts on which people draw when crafting their complicated lives, and that part of what is particularly hard for some people is the very impossibility of building relations structured primarily around affect, pleasure, and satisfaction. I really like this phrasing, but because when we talk about relationships structured primarily around affect, pleasure, and satisfaction, doesn't that sound luxurious? Like, oh, my life is so luxurious. Um, my needs are so few because I'm so wealthy and taken care of that I can just pick somebody who gives me pleasure and I can spend a significant portion of my life just focusing on experiencing pleasure and love with that person. Oh my God, what a luxury. Once we see that companionate marriage is a luxury, I hope we can also understand that it is an ideal. And because it's an ideal, that means that not everyone is going to be able to achieve it. There are a lot of reasons for this. So for example, take poverty. One of the ways that we measure the success of a companionate marriage is partly by the amount of quality time that a couple can spend together. But in order to have that quality time, that means that you have enough money to not be working all the time, right? Ideas about when intimacy matters also vary culturally. And with a companionate marriage, you're supposed to be constantly intimate. You have to keep the romance alive, right? But Hirsch and Wardlow contrast this with attitudes among the Igbo of Nigeria. And amongst the Igbo, Igbo, intimacy is very important for courtship, but not so much after marriage when more structural kinship roles come into play. Local notions of prestige can make companionate marriage hard to do. So in Tanzania, it's very common for men to display their wealth, their success by having multiple wives. Because if you can afford more than one wife, that means you have more than one wife's worth of income and resources. But if you have multiple wives, then you're not being monogamous and you're not really having a companionate marriage. So you can't demonstrate that you're modern. Or if you choose to demonstrate your modernity by having a monogamous companionate marriage and adhering to that ideal, then you can't really demonstrate your prestige. Indigenous ideas about kin obligations can interfere with companionate marriage. Um, one thing that I encountered a lot in my research in Japan is that nobody wants to marry oldest sons because firstborn sons are much more likely to be obligated to care for their parents in their old age and to want a potential spouse to move in with him and his parents. And um, Japanese women don't want this in much the same way that Kazakhstani women don't want to be like a Kellen, right? It's the same thing. Um, and so it's hard to have a companionate relationship under these circumstances because your kin obligations to your parents mean that you can't have the nuclear family ideal, right? So all of these sorts of things and other competing cultural pressures can make it really difficult for people to achieve this ideal. Marriage also has economic components to it, even if we don't like talking about them anymore. I am married and I live together with my spouse and we have a household together, so we have to talk about money sometimes. 
we like to think, I definitely, as a creature of my culture, like to think that my relationship is pure, that money doesn't really have anything to do with it. But really, how free is this free choice that we have? Moreover, is it really fair to use marriage styles as an index, as a way to measure whether somebody is progressive or modern? And finally, what about the fact that many other models of kinship may actually be more empowering or liberating for people than the companionate marriage? Consider the fact that, for example, multi-generational extended family living has childcare built into it. All right, so that's enough for now. Thank you guys for joining me, and I will see you virtually for our next lecture.